Hello everybody, this is Victor Echo 6 Whiskey Golf Mike with you here and I would like to share with you some learnings that I've come across over the last few weeks here um, in my explorations with the Nano VNA. Um, this is a great little device, um, just got it recently here and um, I've been going through a lot of things uh, trying to answer a lot of questions that I've had for a very long time and it turns out the more you learn about amateur radio uh, the more you understand that you really do need to learn more. <laughs> so I'm going to make my best attempt to share with you what I've discovered here. <clears throat> the subject being methods for measuring coax cables, um, the characteristic impedance, and measuring cable loss accurately. Now, I understand that there are some complications with um, these um, measurements, and I'm hoping that I've figured out um, proper ways to do this that are going to give me legitimate values. And I'm hoping to share this with you. And if um, you discover in your viewing of this uh, video that I've made here that um, there are some flaws in either the theory or the information I'm sharing or with the method that I've used, to obtain the values that I have, then I would um, like to encourage you to please uh, share your thoughts with me so that I can learn further and then perhaps revise the video and um, share again. Anyhow, so first things first, uh, in order for the Nano VNA to be of any use to anybody, it needs to be calibrated. So I have here some calibration standards. Um, this one here is an open, this one here is a short, and this is a 50 ohm load. Um, we use these to do what's called a SOLT calibration. This device, the VNA, it's a one path, two port unit. SOLT stands for short, open, load, and through. So we're going to go ahead and perform this calibration and um, hopefully it will ensure that our nano VNA will make um, somewhat accurate readings. Okay, so before we go ahead and do the calibration, it's a good idea to set the uh, nano VNA up so that the span of the frequency range is within the area of interest and that the um, values up above being displayed are also uh, what you're looking for for information. Um, when you go through the calibration and you do the save, it actually saves all of these setup things as well. So we'll go back to our root menu here. And in order to change this, we'll select stimulus and the start frequency. Now, I usually like to start at 500 kilohertz. It's just below the HF band. And that allows me to see what's going on just below uh, my area of interest and then I like to stop at the top here at 30 megahertz now These values up at the top here currently we are displaying uh, Reactants which is great and the Smith chart value um, this is our um, non reactive um, Resistance and this would be our reactive component and it can be displayed in either uh, um or Henry's or uh, Farad's for capacitance. So this displays either our L or C. So it depends on the sign of the of the uh, reactants on the Smith chart as to whether or not that would display as a uh, capacitive or a inductive value. So this other one here, S21, this is the uh, second port on the nano VNA and this is our insertion loss value. Uh, that actually is quite a valuable um, feature of the nano, NO, nano VNA to, to have the two ports on it so that we can make um, uh, single path two port measurements, which um, things like the Rig Expert is, doesn't have that feature. So <clears throat> I see there's one value here missing that I'm interested in, so I'm going to go looking for it here. Uh, so we want to go to display and then the trace and one of the traces is not displaying so that there we go right there So that would be our phase angle We'll bring that one up now So the next step will be to go into the calibration 
routine here and we are going to reset the nano vna now with this having been reset all of the former calibrations are wiped and any kind of a measurement we attempt to do will be absolutely meaningless so we're going to go ahead and start the calibration procedure and it starts by asking for the open okay so i've gone ahead and installed the open here and we'll get this set up again so you can see what's going on and we simply click open then we install the short okay the short is installed we come back over to our nano vna and we click on short next we'll install the load okay load is installed and that is our 50 ohm calibration standard and we'll go ahead and click the load button now isolation is the difference between port S11 and port S21 and normally you'd want to have this terminated with a 50 ohm load as well um, there's internal 50 ohm impedance on that port input port there so I'm not going to worry about it I'll leave the 50 ohm cal standard on the S2 uh, S11 port and we'll go ahead and click isolation and then in order to do the through what we're going to do is we're going to remove the 50 ohm cal standard here and we're going to hook it up and loop it back through to port s21 okay so the get this dialed down here there we go so the isolation calibration tells the nano v in a what a uh um what a zero amplitude signal looks like coming into port S21. So the next step is to take the port port uh, port 11 S11 um, <clears throat> to take and loop that signal out and come back into port S21. And now that is our through calibration, and it tells the nano VNA what this level is at for reference. So now it knows what a full level signal is and what a zero level signal is. And it can then calculate the amount of dB uh, difference um, from, or loss, I guess, uh, between ports S11 and S21 when we go to make that uh, measurement. And we'll click Done. And now we're going to save this in slot zero now it's saved all of those settings and the calibration into slot zero so if we have to reset the nano vna uh, which would be sometimes what happens is you'll get random um, bits of lines or something garbage on the screen that aren't supposed to be there uh, what i do i don't know if there's a way to reset the screen or not but what i do is i just simply power down the vna and then power it back up And then I recall the calibration and all of the settings in the calibration are all then restored back to the way they were. So you probably don't have to do this every time, but I'll show you what I do here. I'm just going to verify the uh, calibration and maybe explain a little bit of how the Smith chart works as well in the process. So <clears throat> if you see here, I have nothing hooked up now after I've... Uh, I've completed the calibration. I have nothing hooked up to the uh, to the cable connected to port S11. And you're, you'll notice that this green marker is all the way to the right. And that uh, position on the Smith chart represents um, <clears throat> an infinitely high resistance. So I'm going to go ahead and connect our short to the nano VNA and I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so we have the short connected and now you'll notice that the green marker is on the far left side of the Smith chart and this portion represents zero. And you'll notice also on the reading here we have three, four milliohms and very little reactance being read. So it looks like the calibration is good. It's not reading inductive or capacitive, and it's reading on the line that uh, indicates that it has a very low resistance. Now, you'll see I mentioned earlier, uh, sometimes you'll get these random bits of lines and things on the screen, and it's, it's happened to us here. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and just reboot the Nano VNA. 
and then recall our calibration and that bit of line is no longer there. So the next is to connect the 50 ohm calibration standard and ensure that the green marker moves to the correct part of the Smith chart. Okay, so I have the 50 ohm cal standard connected now and you'll see that the green marker is now on the normal line of the Smith chart that represents uh, what we've normalized the system to is 50 ohms. If you go above this line, this, this line, by the way, is just purely resistive. So this would be 50 ohms, this would be infinitely high, and this would be infinitely low. If we go above that line, it has now become positive and it is uh, inductively reactive. If we go below the line, it's negative. The sign of the um, complex impedance then is negative and it is capacitive. So if we we notice that the Smith chart's in a circle, um, it, also there will be, uh, I'm going to bring up a phase trace. Uh, right now we're getting a little bit of noise here, so I'm just going to shut that off. But uh, on the Smith chart, this is 0 degrees, this is negative 90, and over here will be 180 degrees. Um, if we're slightly this way, it's 180 degrees uh, capacitive, negative, and if we're slightly this way, it's 180 degrees positive. So this will be positive 90 degrees. So now that we um, understand that the Smith chart is able to tell us a little bit about the uh, um, the complex um, impedance of uh, whatever it is we're measuring, um, and that it's, uh, this unit has the ability to tell us whether something is um, inductive or capacitive. We go ahead and look at this formula here, and you'll see that the uh, characteristic impedance of the coax is equal to the square root of the inductance over the capacitance. So I'm going to show you now how to measure the inductance and capacitance of a short section of coax cable so that we can determine its characteristic impedance. So the idea here is we're going to take just some random bit of coax here. I've actually measured it. It's about 6.4 uh, feet long. Uh, it's been sitting in the, in the drawer for quite some time. I have no idea if it's any good or not. And I'd like to know if the, the cable's uh, loss characteristics and its characteristic impedance is um, within manufacturer specification. One thing that I should mention with the VNA when we calibrate it, um, you can actually uh, calibrate using the Cal standards here at the port, and then you'd have to make your measurements connected directly to this point uh, in order to have accurate measurements. Or you can calibrate at the end of a section of coax cable, and now the VNA sees this as its reference point, and anything beyond this is what it'll be looking at, and it'll ignore everything prior. So this is kind of a handy feature I thought I should mention because if you ever wind up in a situation where you've got uh, a coax cable and it's um, 100 feet long, say, and you want to see uh, what's going on with your antenna up on your mast, you can actually take and hook the coax up to your port on your nano VNA, use the calibration standards at the end of the 100 foot section of coax and then go up plug into your antenna and you can make measurements using the nano VNA as if the antenna was plugged right here. Okay, I've noticed something else a little bit interesting here. Um, you'll see this yellow line here. This is representing the reactance that the nano VNA is seeing here. And <clears throat> I've calibrated using the Cal standards right at the end here because that was all I have is those SMA connectors. Um, now I've gone and added an adapter here. This line, the yellow line was flat. And now I'm starting to see some reactance here. So I'm actually starting to read a little bit of reactance off of this device right here. So this is why it's really important to try to calibrate your nano VNA, um, if at all possible, with everything connected and what it is you're going to be um, you know, using for your adapter setup prior to connecting any cables. Now, I don't have 
Um, well, actually, I could plug a dummy load into this, but there's another section of cable on it, and it's going to add even more. So I kind of am taking a gamble and saying I would rather connect my, my Cal standard here than have it through here, through another 6-inch section of cable after this, and then it's going to see that that's missing, and it's just going to cause even more grief. So I'm going to ignore this little bit of reactance, and it's up at a frequency that I'm not really all that interested in anyhow for today. So... I'm just going to ignore it and we're going to carry on and plug a piece of uh, coax cable into here and begin our testing. So I've gone ahead and plugged the coax cable into port S11 on the Nano VNA and the other end of the cable is open and if we come back and look at the screen here there are some interesting things here. Let's see if we can figure out what it all means. So <clears throat> you'll notice this um, purple line here and there's it's kind of a Z shaped this is characteristic of a um, of uh, a point at which on this frequency chart here uh, on this in the, within this range of frequencies where um, something has become resonant and there's a very sharp um, uh, change in the rotation of the phase from negative to positive there. So it's gone from being capacitive and all of a sudden it's flipped over to being inductive. Um, <clears throat> at this frequency right here where the inductive reactants and the capacitive reactants are equal is the point of resonance. So <clears throat> believe it or not, this cable right now actually has a natural frequency of resonance and let's see, just out of curiosity, what that frequency is. So if we go in as close as we can get with the nano VNA, and we look for a phase angle. So if you look at the phase here, uh, watch, watch the phase angle here when I'm, when I'm uh, messing with the frequency here. So right now we're at 178 degrees positive, which means we are inductive. And we rotate around. Now all of a sudden we're at negative 178 degrees uh, on the capacitive side. So uh, th at this point here, um, this is approaching 180 degrees negative, and if we go uh, just a tad more, it crosses over and it's on the uh, positive 180 degrees. Uh, this would be our phase angle. Um, so what's interesting about this, um, and what, it, does it, what does it mean to us for this particular um, measurement? Well, at this point, you can see that it's it's kind of, there's some crazy things going on here. There's resonance happening. So we want to stay away from that particular frequency. Um, so this cable has become resonant at 23.215 megahertz. We do not want to use that frequency to make our measurements. What I typically do is I automatically just take and go for with the open-ended cable it looks capacitive so I want to take negative 90 degrees phase angle and you can see where the green marker is and it's rotated all the way down to the very bottom of the Smith chart here and that's about as capacitive as you're going to get so at 90 degrees phase angle let's just adjust here a bit more uh, the frequency that we are going to take our measurements at is 11.710 megahertz. And we're going to use that same frequency for both our capacitive and our inductive measurements. So seeing as how we're on the capacitive side already, we'll take a look here and read it. We are at 271 picofarads. So if we look at the formula for capacitive reactants, it includes a frequency and um, a uh, reactance value. So from that frequency and the reactance value, you can calculate the amount of capacitance that must be there in order for uh, there to be this much capacitive reactance at that frequency. So... Um, this unit is doing that calculation for us, so we don't have to do it on paper. That's quite convenient. Okay, so I'm going to change over now and short this end, the other end of the cable, and that will cause the cable to appear to be inductive. Okay, so the other end of the cable has been shorted, and now we see that our green arrow, uh, it might be a little bit hard to see, but it's rotated all the way around the Smith chart, 
and it's gone to 90 degrees positive, which is about as inductive as you're going to get. And we've maintained the same frequency at 11.71 megahertz, and the inductive value that we are getting at this point is 693 nanohenries. So I'm just going to make a note of that, 693 nanohenries. And now we're going to plug that in to our formula, Z, our characteristic impedance, is equal to the square root of 693 nanohenries over 271 picofarads. We're going to pull out our handy-dandy Texas Instruments calculator. And we have been using this formula already. And so I'm going to cheat. I'm just going to go up and drop that formula right down into our little working area here. And then I'm going to change the values. So this would be the inductor, and that is 693 um, nanohenry, so milli micro nano, so it would be times 10 to the negative 9. And then our capacitance value will be 271 picofarads, which is times 10 to the negative 12 for pico, and that it is. Hit the button, and we are reading 50.687 ohms characteristic impedance. 50.587 ohms. Sounds pretty good to me. So I guess what I forgot to mention here earlier is that the cable we're using here um, for our test here, this is Belden 8259 coaxial cable. So I've looked up the specifications for that cable and it has a loss of one and a half decibels per 100 feet at 10 megahertz. The nominal impedance is 50 ohms. Velocity factor 0 0.66 and nominal capacitance is 30.8 picofarads per foot. So you see from our calculation that the nominal impedance, according to the manufacturer, is 50 ohms, and we read 50.5687. So at this point, it's looking like the cable is doing pretty good. So our next uh, chore will be to take and to measure the cable's loss. So our next measurement is going to be the cable's loss characteristics, and we're going to then take and uh, use that to compare it to the manufacturer's specifications um, for the loss of this particular cable given its length. And um, I, I have to make mention, though, of um, um, using the return loss method. What I used to do was, um, well, I'll give you the theory here. So we've got a signal generator here, and we've calibrated the VNA to uh, begin reading things from this point on. We're sending the signal down the line, and it comes out to the other end. Now, if we have an open or a short on this end, what it does is it reflects the signal, all of it, back down the line to the signal source again. Uh, now, the Nano VNA, this S11 port, um, it not only has a signal generator to push signal out, but it also has a... Uh, a directional coupler inside that can view what's coming back and that's how it uh, takes its readings so the theory is is that if this is open or shorted it doesn't really matter it's going to reflect all of the power back so we should be able to get the same reading of loss through this cable whether it's open or shorted um, now, the theory being is, is that when the signal travels down the cable here, there's going to be loss, it's going to come out to here, it's going to bounce back and in, um, see the same loss again. So the loss actually that we'll read here will be double what we think it should be um, based on the return loss readings. Now, <clears throat> I was pointed towards an interesting article. Um, it was... Um, on, on a Nano VNA website or uh, Facebook page and one of the other fellows there um, corrected me and told me about um, some of Frank Witt's work that's AI1H and I apologize for the horrible um, writing here I'll actually put the link to his uh, article here measuring cable loss I'll put the link in the face or in the um, in the YouTube video notes there below
And what he's saying is, is that because of the uh, nano v VNA being, or any VNA, being calibrated using a non-reactive 50 ohm straight resistive load, um, and now we are coupling that into a very complex um, device under test, uh, there is slight mismatches there. And what that tends to do is, is it skews the readings and makes them inaccurate. So one symptom that he mentioned of this happening would be that if we take and take a, a, a return loss measurement with the end of this cable open and a return loss measurement with the end of that cable shorted, um, we should see the same value, but if we don't, then that's probably what's happening. And then he goes on to explain some math to try to uh, uh, come up with a more accurate method of, of testing. So here was what we're going to do first off, is we're going to make the, te the, the test, we're going to perform it with it shorted and with it open. We're going to compare the two readings, and we're going to see if our friend Frank Witt AI1H, um, if his um, comments are accurate. Okay, so back to the VNA. I have the short end, the, the, the end of the cable is shorted. So we're going to, we need to bring up another uh, variable here. So we're, we're probably just going to change the phase here. So I'll go back and, uh, oops, we need to tune this down a bit. So this trace here that we've selected, it's the purple one. We're going to make that one uh, format. We are going to look for log ma Oh, sorry. Boy, this is hard uh, trying to do this through the camera lens. There, log mag. Now, that is our return loss reading that we're seeing there right now. So the signal is being sent out through the cable. It's being attenuated. It's bouncing at the end. It's coming all the way back. And in that process, it's seeing 0 0.36 decibels of attenuation. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down. So this would be our return loss shorted is equal to 0 0.36 dB. Next, we're going to measure our return loss open and compare the two, and we will see if these two values are different, then we know that uh, our friend there, his theory is correct. Okay, the coax cable is now open, and in theory we should say the same return loss, and guess what, we don't. We see 0 0.07 decibels of return loss, so there's a difference there. So the reactance of that coax cable is definitely messing with our readings, and we can't just take and uh, guess the, the loss of the cable based on an open or a short on its own. So now, uh, using the math that um, our friend has proposed here, and he goes about explaining where this comes from. And if you're interested, I would highly um, suggest you go look up the article. It's uh, posted on the ARRL website, and I'll get, I'll put the notes uh, below, the link for that below. And we're going to use this formula here. Um, he also posts other formulas to uh, calculate the same thing based on SWR. Um, so we're measuring return loss, so we're going to use that formula here. So I'm going to do a little bit of math here. So our, our cable loss is going to be equal to our shorted, which is 0 0.36 dB, plus our open, which is 0 0.07 dB over 4. And he explains where that comes from. We're going to pull out the handy dandy Texas Instruments calculator here again, and we're going to do 0.36 plus 0.07 equals that divided by 4. And so, according to this, our loss should be approximately 1, uh, 0.1075. 0 0.1075 dB loss. Okay, now we're going to we're going to compare that value to um, another method that I use. Um, in this method here actually um, is useful if you have 
um, the coax where you've got to run a coax and you don't have both ends of the coax available to be plugged into the vector network analyzer. One end is off somewhere, you can't get it close. So you can source into it, but you can't plug the other end to sample what's coming out of it. Um, <clears throat> so what you can do in that case is just what I've done here, is you can take your uh, return loss reading with it open, um, with it shorted, do the math, and then come up with a value. Now the second uh, option, and this is the one I prefer to use, um, because it, it, it doesn't revol involve having to pull out the calculator to do any math, and uh, it utilizes the both ports of the vector network analyzer, um, and that is simply to take and uh, plug this end of the coax cable into our port 2 to make an S21 measurement and this is where I was explaining earlier when we did the calibration that it now will see the difference or the loss between the two ports and it'll conveniently just tell us uh, compared to what it's putting in how many dB loss it sees here. We're going to go ahead and hook that up and take a look. Okay so the um we are sourcing into the cable and we're looping back into S21 port and we're going to take an insertion loss reading which looks like 0 0.12 dB. So we're going to make a note of that. 0 0.12 dB loss on that cable according to our S21 reading which is insertion loss. So these values are actually pretty close. I'm quite happy with them. Um, that suggests to me that this one is probably just about as accurate as this one. Now, <clears throat> back to um, uh, Frank Witt. He was saying that as long as the characteristic impedance of the coax cable is fairly close to our um, normalized um, impedance that we've used to calibrate our VNA, as long as those are fairly close, which is, I'm using a 50 ohm um, non-reactive load to calibrate the VNA, and if our characteristic impedance of the coax cable is pretty close to 50 ohms, and we measured it earlier, and it was at 50.687 ohms, so it's pretty close. Um, as long as these values are close, you're going to get fairly decent readings out of this. Now, if we were to take and try and test a 75 ohm piece of cable, and use this method, it's probably not going to work. And um, there are other methods to do so. That. As far as doing an insertion loss on a 75 ohm cable, I don't know how you're going to do that because this input here is its characteristic impedance is 50 ohms, so you won't be able to plug that in and get any kind of a reading. I've never tried it and probably don't, uh, probably never will. So I just thought I'd make mention of it. Um, that it's not quite so simple when you're uh, trying to measure something, um, a, a piece of coax cable who's with the characteristic impedance, it's not equal to 50 ohms. Okay, so now we've gone and verified that both those methods um, seem to work pretty good. Um, we've been doing this at a frequency of 11.71 megahertz. I just kind of left that frequency alone because that's where the um, uh, the reactance was at um, positive and negative 90 degrees when we um, open uh, applied an open and a short to the end of the cable for doing our uh, capacitance and our inductance readings. Um, now the manufacturer specification for this cable, if we want to figure out what the loss is and compare that to what it's supposed to be and decide from that if the cable is worth uh, keeping or not, um, I went and googled the uh, that Belden 8259 cable and the manufacturer specification, it, it lists 1.5 if we just move over to here, 1.5 dB per 100 feet of loss. That's what's expected from that cable if it's brand new. Um, so now th there's an important thing here. This is at a frequency of 10 megahertz. Now there's different loss. There's a, uh, a chart there. Um, there's different losses for different frequencies. The higher the frequency, the greater the loss. So because 10 megahertz is listed by the manufacturer and it lies within the range of frequencies that I'm going to be operating in, um, I'm going to use this one as my point of reference. So that piece of coax cable I measured earlier, and it is 6.583 feet long. Now if we take and divide that by 100 feet, we get 0 0.0658. 
and then we multiply that by one and a half dB of loss, according to the specifications from Belden, and our expected loss is going to be 0 0.10 dB. So that's what we expect from this cable, and look at what we were reading above here. That's, that's all making a lot of sense here. Pretty close, but our frequency is off just a bit. So the important part here is we have to make these measurements at 10 megahertz. So we're gonna go and repeat these, value, these um, calculations again. Um, actually, what I'll do is I'll just do an insertion loss, but I'm gonna change the analyzer to 10 megahertz to do the measurement. I'm gonna show you something here. Uh, if we want a specific frequency, because you notice before I set up our lower was 500 kilohertz and our high was 30 megahertz, we don't really want to sweep through that whole range. Um, you, you remember when I said that uh, the, the analyzer sweeps and it takes 100 um, data points and plots them? And sometimes you can't always get it on frequency, so I'll show you that here. Can we even get 10 megahertz on the button? Oh, wrong way. Um, no, we can't. We can't. It falls between the two data points. So here's what we're going to do. Is we're going to back out of this. Oops. We're going to back out of this. And again. And then we're going to go into our stimulus. Uh, let's see here. Okay. We're going to go into the stimulus menu. And we're going to choose CW frequency. So what that does is it lets us... Um, source uh, a signal at one frequency only instead of sweeping through a range. So I'm going to select 10 megahertz. Now, we are producing only one frequency, and it's the same frequency that the manufacturer is suggesting we should use. So now that we've got that set up, and we still have the um, cable connected from S11 port to S21 port, we are going to make a measurement here so at 10 megahertz I am seeing an insertion loss of 0.11 dB measured so I'm just gonna make a note of that that was our insertion loss measured So everything seems to make sense here. Our calculation says we should see 0 0.10 dB, and that's according to the manufacturer specs, and at, at 10 megahertz. And we've adjusted the nano VNA to 10 megahertz, and we read 0 0.11. That's excellent. So I think this coax cable is in good shape. Um, I feel pretty confident that I should be able to put it into service, and it will do what I need it to do. So the next step will be to take um, a large piece of cable and test it. Uh, this was a relatively short little bit. I was kind of trying to test the um, the resolution of the nano VNA to be able to test something so short with a small amount of attenuation. This is really not a lot of attenuation here. So what I'm going to do now is I've got a really old chunk of RG213. It's 100 feet long. And we're going to perform the same tests on that piece of cable, and we're going to find out uh, whether that old weathered piece of cable is still worthy of being used or not. Okay, so I've got my RG213 connected here to the uh, Vector Network Analyzer, and I've left the uh, other end of it open. I took a, um, a Google search here and um, wound up generally seeing a 0 0.6 db per 100 feet of loss expected at 10 megahertz that's generally there was 0 0.55 and 0 0.66 and a couple others but generally it seems like 0 0.6 is the consensus um, this cable is uh, not belden branded um, i'm not able to find exactly the manufacturer for this cable so i'm not exactly certain but i'm thinking 0 0.6 looks like it should be uh, pretty close the characteristic impedance by most of the manufacturers is listed as 50 ohms plus or minus 2 ohms. So we're going <clears> to <throat> actually take and do the, uh, the, uh, the return loss measurements first, I guess. Uh, we'll do it backwards this time. 
we're going to take the return loss measurement, um, 10 megahertz. See, I've got an open end, so this will be RLO, and I see a return loss of 1.6 dB. So we'll mark that one down, 1.6 dB. And now I'll insert my short here, and I'll be right back. Okay, so the end of the cable is now shorted, and we once again take our in, um, return loss measurement, 1.72 dB. And we will make a note of that, 1.72 dB. And we'll use our handy dandy Texas Instruments calculator, 1.6 plus 1.72 divided by 4, 0.83 dB, 0 0.83 dB, that's, um, actually we didn't calculate what we were expecting, let's go ahead and do that as well, so, th okay, so I believe this cable is about 104 feet long, um, <clears throat> 104 divided by 100, so we have a factor of 1.04 times our loss at 100 dB at 10 megahertz is 0 0.6 dB times 0 0.6 is 0 0.624 dB is expected loss. Okay, so far we've got a 0.83, so we're a little higher than what we think we should be at, um, but this is aged cable. So we're going to go ahead and take an insertion loss type measurement because I do have access to both ends of this cable, and we'll see if it, that reading corresponds with what we're seeing so far. Okay, so I've gone ahead and connected both ends of the coax cable to the VNA. And um, again, just to stress, we have to make sure that we are reading... Um, oops, let's... Uh, what did I do? We are reading the uh, frequency here, um, the, using the correct frequency to perform the test. I don't know what I've gone and done here. Oh, I guess I adjusted the scaling. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we are... Uh, reading let's see here so the insertion the insertion loss here reading is 0 0.78 db so the insertion loss is 0 0.77 db still again it's a bit higher than what we expect um, not by a lot but uh, it is a little bit higher i i'm thinking the cable actually doesn't look too bad from a loss perspective. Let's go ahead and make the uh, characteristic impedance measurement. So that would be Z will be equal to the square root of L over C, if you remember from our RG58 cable measurements. And we'll go ahead and begin this procedure. Okay, I've got our cable hooked up here with the short on the end. Now, this should appear to be... Uh, reactive to the positive so it should appear to be inductive which it does um, I just want to bring up uh, change one of the traces here so I'm gonna make the purple one format and I want to read the phase and so I'm going to use the same trick as I did for the RG 58 and I'm gonna try to get my phase adjusted to okay so you can see that I don't have enough resolution there to get it close to 90 degrees, uh, I'm going to pick a frequency that um, is not falling on one of those resonant points of the cable. So let's see, 9.94. Let's take and change the stimulus. I'm going to zoom in a bit. I'm going to make it from 9 megahertz, and we're going to stop it at 11 megahertz. 
and let's see if I can find a point. Okay, so you see right here, this is one of those points where the cable becomes resonant, and we want to stay away from that frequency. What I want is to adjust up to the 90 degree. There we go. And that is, uh, let's see, 88, 86, 88, 91. Okay, we'll pick that one. So I'm going to make these measurements at a frequency of 9.98 megahertz which is away from the uh, point of resonance and it's um, about as far inductive as we're going to get so I'm going to read now the inductance is 765 nano henrys so let's take and do this 765 nano henrys and now I'm going to disconnect my short and open up the other end of the cable and it will become capacitive. Okay, so now the, uh, the end of the cable is open. And you'll see now that uh, everything has rotated around here, the Smith chart. And it is now negative 90 degrees, pretty close. I've left the frequency the same. We have to do that. Once we pick a frequency, we have to hold it there. And our reading is 316 picofarads. 316 picofarads. So now we're going to use the calculator once again. And we'll uh, go back up and pull that formula down again. We're going to cheat. Here. There we go. And we're going to insert the correct values. So to begin with, we have 765 nano henrys and nano, millimicro and nano, so that's negative 9, that's correct. And the capacitance is 316 picofarads, so that would be times 10 to the negative 12. And our answer is 49.203 ohms. So that falls within specification as well. Um, the one manufacturer listed theirs as 50 ohms plus or minus 2. So this definitely falls within spec. So I'm thinking this old coax is actually, uh, it passes as well. Well, there you have it. This is what I've learned about using the nano vna for measuring the characteristic impedance of coax and for measuring coax cable loss hopefully the methods and the uh, information i've given you and the math as well is all correct in this uh, video and if you happen to uh, notice that there are any mistakes uh, please let me know and i'll correct the video and reissue it so that i don't uh, perpetuate um, incorrect methods or information. I find amateur radio is uh, a great hobby. Uh, one of the things with amateur radio though is, is the more you learn, uh, the more you realize you need to learn. <laughs> and uh, that's I think why it becomes a lifelong hobby for so many people. Anyhow, I hope you enjoy the hobby as much as I do and I also hope that this information has been helpful for you. And uh, this little device here, I think, is going to really uh, help a lot of us uh, make leaps and bounds um, improvements on our knowledge and understanding of um, how things work as far as coax cables and balance and antennas and understanding uh, complex impedances and how everything interacts. Thank you for watching.